Hi, this is Dr. Clyde. I'm going to read to you the first research update for fasting and dieting, which is straight from the post that you can read that includes the links that I'll be referencing as I read through this. So you'll see my eyes leave uh, the camera here in a second as I read through it, that uh, the research update is going to cover the scientific literature on uh, the spectrum of dieting for weight loss with intermittent fasting and the various types of that to uh, restricting calories, so you're, you're not skipping meals entirely, but rather eating smaller amounts at any given time, and then shifting from there to how you manipulate macronutrients. Do you go high fat? Do you slow down the digestion rate of carbohydrates? How does protein play into this? So from timing to caloric restriction to macronutrient manipulation. And to start the conversation, and I'm reading here, consider that fasting can burn up more muscle than fat in your body. And so my title is Intermittent Fasting Burns You Up and Out. You can lose twice the lean tissue as fat skipping breakfast. Fasting's metabolic benefits come at a high cost. Your body consuming itself. No matter how much fat you burn during fasting, lean tissue loss is inevitable. This is because your body needs more than just fat. Intermittent fasting by skipping breakfast therefore burns up twice as much lean tissue as fat. And there's a reference. Skipping breakfast might sound like an easy way to cut calories and rejuvenate the body into youth and health, but at the cost of the very tissue that you're trying to help. This raises the question of what to eat. If fasting is so amazing, why ever stop? Why ever eat anything at all? While this question might sound absurd, the popularity of fasting begs it to be asked. And it leads to four deeper questions whose answers are not so obvious. At what point does fasting begin to hurt you immediately? Are the benefits of fasting better than caloric restriction? No. Is caloric restriction always better than fasting? Not if you eat processed food. And how can you include some processed food in your diet answer by combining it with vegetables. Now, in a little bit more detail. Number one, one are fasting benefits outweighed by its detriments? The short answer is immediately. Caloric and carbohydrate restriction, instead of fasting, support the cells and our vital organs to maintain their continuous needs. Cells cannot turn off their needs just because we're not feeding them. So they eat each other by the brain stimulating the release of stress hormones, particularly cortisol, to break down muscle mass to benefit vital organs. So to reiterate here, your body needs more than just fats. That's why we can't just elevate fat burning without putting lean tissue at risk. Question two, do human studies show caloric restriction provides the same benefits we're trying to achieve with fasting? Yes. Every study that compares them shows fasting provides no benefits beyond its caloric restriction. Even if you weren't even if you weren't intermittently fasting to try to cut calories, generally uh, there ends up being a reduction in caloric intake, and the benefits come from that. There is therefore no additional unique benefit of fasting beyond its underlying caloric restriction, and fasting accelerates lean tissue loss, whereas caloric restriction does not so long as you eat healthy foods, as explained in the next question. Question three, is caloric restriction enough to get the same benefits of fasting? No, it's not. Processed food, in particular processed carbohydrates, trigger an insulin response in the body, sending out the signal that you are overfed even if you're underfed, like if you're eating candy or cake. This is an overfed signal even if there's not a lot of calories. This is like filling your car's gas tank so fast that the gas overflows out onto your feet even though the tank is still empty. The delivery of the gas to the tank has to be slow enough to go through the delivery line or it comes shooting out as if the tank were full. Likewise, the delivery of carbohydrates through your bloodstream must be slow enough to be taken up by your cells or else it will skyrocket your blood sugar. By the way, there's only 25 calories or so of sugar in your five to six liters of blood. So a piece of candy is about that. So it can double your blood sugar quickly. Flooding carbs into your bloodstream therefore forces your body to go into an overflooded response, even if you've barely eaten anything. Think candy, soda, chips, juice, cookies, muffins, and anything else made out of processed sugar and or flour. Fasting followed by processed carbs is therefore the worst combination, whittling away at lean tissue both when you are eating as well as when you are not. Question four, 
how can I continue to occasionally eat the processed foods I love without them hurting me so much that I keep having to struggle with diets to make up for it? Answer, eat processed foods right after exercise when your lean tissue is absor absorbing calories faster, and at all other times, eat processed foods together with unprocessed foods within the same meal to slow the rate of nutrient digestion and delivery. For example, having vegetables or salad in the same meal as processed carbohydrates provides a profound clinical, clinical benefit to type 2 diabetics, and there's a reference in the post. The detriments of processed carbohydrate and unhealthy fats are the main driving forces behind the obesity and di diabetes epidemics as well as our search for the best diet to counter how we wish we could eat that led to those epidemics in the first place. Inactivity and stress both worsen the effects of a poor diet and an incre increase our tendency to have a poor diet. The belief that it just comes down to calories, lending itself to cutting fats out of the diet, was replaced decades ago with a focus on not simply how much, but what we should eat. Diets therefore emerged with opposing viewpoints as their creators overemphasized one food group over another, some touting vegetables, others protein, or more recently keto diets espousing mainly fats, which is the extreme opposite of what dieters used to focus on. All of these diets function by steering adherence away from processed carbohydrates, but none of them eliminate our psychological need for those carbs, nor do any ensure that someone's full balance of nutrient needs are being met. There is no diet that can keep you healthy if it does not meet your needs, since health and meeting your needs are the same thing. If your needs are met both with respect to the specific nutrients and getting enough calories to avoid losing lean tissue, then any diet with a bit of caloric restriction can deliver the healthy weight loss you are after. What to eat is covered in a separate research update tab on the homepage. The best and most current caloric need equations from which you could estimate your maximum 25% caloric restriction beyond which health and lean tissue are at greater risk was published by the National Academy of Medicine this year 2023 in this free in a free online text where the equations are on page 80 and the link is in the post as you look at these equations you can see how our caloric needs scale with age height weight and activity levels with our height and weight having ever greater impact on our needs as our activity levels increase this gives you a sense of how much energy it takes to accelerate based on mass and create torque based on height to move our body and limbs, respectively, during activity. We know from published research that non-exercise movement throughout the day can double our caloric needs, as referenced in the post, and that inactivity and dieting can cut your needs in half because of how the body adapts by shutting down to conserve calories. And there's a reference to my research in that, in that topic in the post. This is why calculating your caloric needs only gives you an average need. But you might need double that or only half that amount. And taking exercise into consideration increases the calorie range even more. So instead of calculating caloric needs that have such a large dynamic range, I recommend shifting how you eat based on what you're already doing to achieve your goals without counting calories at all. You already know what foods and how much of them you tend to eat, and you know your goals. Shift what it looks like on your plate instead of crunching numbers. Because our body can rev up or shut down so much with respect to how many calories it burns, without a focus on providing your body enough calories and nutrients to keep going, dieting can easily backfire and work against you as you struggle to achieve your goals. The worst case scenario is the combination of hard exercise and barely eating, raising your body's needs while reducing what is supplied at the same time. If the gap between supply and demand reduce, reduces uh, and impedes your health and fitness goals because uh, of your body struggling to heal and function, then strict workouts and dieting, particularly when com combined, can be worse than ineffective, plateauing or even reversing your progress. And this is Dr. Clyde signing out. I'll see you on the next research update.